Welcome to the LED Epoxy River Table Masterclass. So there's some certain steps to make this thing come to life. Okay. okay. Learn every step right now to create success using epoxy and wood. What I'm about to tell you is a big unlock and a big pro tip. This dynamic tutorial is chocked full of professional secrets that will guarantee you have a blast while making functional art. So I put a little shimmer, a high point as a fulcrum. Boom. There's your river table. <laughs> okay, all I'm gonna do now is just screw these corners in so that it has strength like a box. I'm wiping the dust so that that tape has a very good bond. Mm -hmm. How do I know how much metallic <laughs> to put in the epoxy to keep it as translucent as I want? I'm gonna teach you. The countless pro tips you're gonna learn in this woodworking masterclass are absolute game changers. And you see this? Yeah. That's a piece of metal, okay? That's gonna kill my router bit, okay? Definitely. So I definitely gotta get that out before I bring my slab jig into this thing and mess up my router bit, <laughs> all right? This is a two to one ratio, okay? okay. So a lot of our uh, mixtures are a one to one ratio. Yes. This is a different mixture. Just like our floor epoxy is a two to one. So that means two parts A to one part B. We've been asked to go in depth on the details, and this is it. We don't use a drill on this. We use a mixing stick. And you're gonna notice the viscosity is very thin on our supercast. We get very crystal clear results by mixing this with a stick and pouring it and torching it about every half inch or quarter inch. I take that cup okay. and I put a mark. Now I know exactly how deep that river is. That metallic color popping out of there. I told you, man. Oh, isn't that cool? Learn the tips and tricks of epoxy additives and how to use them in woodworking and river tables. By leaving our project semi-transparent, it made the LEDs look like a wonder. We could change it to any color. So that's how I get a square piece out of a tree. See how it shows you the high and low points immediately? Yeah. Good job, you did a really good job on that. Join me while we work with Jeff on his first woodworking project. Safety insurance is absolutely worth a half inch. Learn proper woodworking layout, how to build a form, how to deep pour, finishing, and more. Learn to create a non-porous surface with seal coats and finishing with a flood coat. Learn how to tent any project to create that tone in the wood that you desire. Adding epoxy finishing to your project list? Watch this video. That was easy, right? Oh yeah. Getting a flawless glassed out surface is easier than you think. Mounting and hiding the river table LED lights is an absolute must. You need to follow these instructions so you can hide the definition of those lights, but get the ambient glow that makes that project come to life. Oh, that's gonna be sick. A river table is an absolute showpiece and will enhance any space. Oh my gosh. Can you believe how this looks? Oh my gosh. Heirloom quality dining tables, kitchen accent islands, vanities, conference room tables, and more. Guys, in this video, I'm gonna show you how to take a slab of wood and turn it into functional art. You got this. Make sure you subscribe and ring the bell to get notified every time we have a new video. Thanks again. I'm working on a, a place for my mom and dad right now. Yeah. And uh, this is like the showpiece. The, the island in the kitchen is where everybody gathers. Yes. Okay? So it's on the river, so why not a river table? Table. Right? You like the idea? <laughs> yeah, I love it. I took you out there to that to that cabin. What do you think, man? Oh, it's gorgeous. It looks like a log cabin, right? It looks so It was an, it was an ugly duckling. It was a cinder block house and we're turning... My, mom, my mom's uh, dream is, is a log home, so... I think this goes with that, you know? So this is a piece of redwood. It was standing dead, man. Like, it would be a crime to cut this down and turn it into firewood. Man. So, <laughs> I mean, look at, look at the color in that. It's gorgeous. So there's some certain steps to make this thing come to life, okay? okay. So every tree has different types of bark. Redwood bark comes off actually pretty easily. Okay. So we're gonna rip the bark off. Then we're actually gonna cut this slab down the middle. Now what that does, is it gives us two pieces to then flip into each other to create that free flowing river. Yeah. Okay. Steps that we're gonna start with is just taking the bark off. Okay. okay. And you see this? Yeah. That's a piece of metal. 
okay? That's gonna kill my router bit, okay? Definitely. So I definitely gotta get that out before I bring my slab jig into this thing and mess up my router bit, all right? <laughs> I'm gonna follow that angle just along this. Okay. And usually that's how easy this comes out and I'm just gonna work it as I go. Okay. Boom. That was easy, right? Oh yeah. Let's flip this around and do the other side. Okay. Pro tip, test your moisture content and be sure it's under 13%. Okay, you wanna start at this end and do this side? Yeah. Nice, you're there now. Yeah. I appreciate you letting me have the opportunity to help with uh, making something that's for your parents. Oh man, yeah. yeah this I is gonna be a special that. project, man. Yeah, it's a very special project. So what I'm gonna do is just prep my live edge. I wanna have a, a really smooth surface when I start. And so my 50 grit metal sanding disc, it's the workhorse. It's gonna remove stock very fast. This is the same tool I use to kind of put in a fake live edge, but this has none of that. It's all just natural. So I'm just gonna remove it down to that actual wood and get rid of any excess bark. I'm using a 50 grit sanding disc that has been previously worn out a tad. This allows me to get somewhat more aggressive without messing with the shape of the live edge. That's a pro tip, a fun fact on how to get it done and not overdo that live edge. While woodworking, keep in mind design and concept and finished look. I like leaving some evidence of that bark so that I get the contrast of the high and low tones left behind on that live edge. What do you think? Looks awesome. Pretty effective bark removal, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's the island cabinet that it's gonna go on. Let's say that we used that and we wanted a 15 inch overhang. Did you not want a one inch overhang on the other side? No, it butts a wall. Okay. Good question. Boom. Okay, let go. Okay. Measure twice, cut once. I'm actually leaving a little excess on this slab table. I don't mind finishing a little more than I need. I can always trim it to size, but the tree, it doesn't grow back after you cut it. So be sure to plan accordingly and leave a little extra meat on the bone. So Jeff, here on the end grain, mm -hmm. as, the, as the grain is running this way and it stops, yeah. I wouldn't want to just split this wood down to break off the remaining of the cut because it's going to grab that those splits and it's either going to splinter this way or that way and I don't want to sacrifice anything on the top. Okay? okay. So I'll use the sawzall to finish the cut, but on this long cut that goes with with the grain, yeah. I'll score it as far as I can and we'll be pretty safe to snap the rest instead of trying to sawzall it. Okay. Because it's going with the grain, it won't splinter out. Perfect. Does that make sense? Yeah. When the slabs that I work with are slightly too thick for my skill saw to plunge through, I'll finish the cut with a jigsaw or a sawzall. There you go. Okay, well you just hold that down over here. Yep. We're drawing the center point of the slab so that I can score through it with my skill saw. I start with a medium cut and then I finalize it with a plunge cut deep down the center. So again, I do two passes. Right. If I do one pass, the blade wants to wander a little bit more. It wants to grab the wood grain and kind of pull. So I'd rather do two passes and be safer. All right, you want to see a trick? Yeah. Again, the depth of my skill saw blade wasn't quite tall enough to finish the cut. So I put a little shimmer, a high point as a fulcrum. Boom. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. Grab this, set it on this other side. We created a true rectangular river table by turning the two live edges into themselves. There's your river table. <laughs> I have an idea on the color. What? You know, we have we have like that black and white and and kind of cool looking marble we're doing for the counters. Yeah. If we incorporated those same colors, a lot of times we do like a, a popping color like blue or something. Yeah. Totally popping. But if we emulated those colors as if that stone was put into here, but we left it translucent where that light will still come through a little bit. Oh. Now you can get that pop of crazy color at night when it's time to party, but during the day it matches the counters. <laughs> so the step right now is to make sides. Okay, we're gonna actually rip this in half so that we can make sides for this form. Okay, this is two and a half inches tall. So we're gonna rip three inch strips. But to try to rip this on my table saw, it's quite cumbersome because I got a four by eight sheet trying to get it up there and run it through the saw. So I'm gonna do 24 inches 
and that'll be easy to rip through. So I'll just cut this in half. And then we're gonna use our full sheet right here to set that table, we'll mock it up, and then we'll screw our sides right to that. Okay. Now remember, we bought that Tyvek tape because it will release off the epoxy. We'll Tyvek tape the whole inside of the form. Okay. Everything will come out like, like uh, an easy bake oven. Okay, I like that. If you wanna build an easy bake oven, follow this video. Okay, anyhow. <laughs> uh, what am I leaving out, man? You got any questions? What are we waiting for? You got this. We got this. <laughs> All right. Okay. 24 inches. Okay. I'm starting with a four by eight sheet of melamine that was purchased at a hardware store. This is a perfect medium to create your epoxy form for the river table. I line it with Tyvek tape so the epoxy will release off of it after I've poured. My sheet goods cutting table is topped with a piece of foam. That way I can cut all the way through and I'm just scoring into foam. Nice. Cuts it straight. A good rule of thumb is to be about a half inch proud of the thickness of your table. That way uh, any epoxy that you pour will never go over your table and then out of the form. It's just a little extra insurance for a little bit more material safety. Insurance is absolutely worth a half inch. While cutting the vertical sides of my epoxy form, I make it a half inch taller than the slab of wood. That way no epoxy finds its way out of the form. We're gonna put a straight run first on this thing. Let's go measure our table. It's about 89, so we'll just keep them eight feet long. All right, this is great. So this pocket screw machine, it drills holes like this, okay? Okay. So those holes allow us to butt screw things. Yeah. So this is how we're gonna screw it down to a form. Okay. okay. So that's what that's what I'm making right now. And uh, you can do this with a drill and a hand jig, which looks like this right here. Okay. But this tool does the same thing a lot faster. And since I'm really fancy, I have one. So we're gonna use it, okay? <laughs> okay. I rely on pocket screw joinery a lot in woodworking. Are we answering the tips and tricks that you need? Let me know in the comments section if you have any questions. We'll be attending to those comments and answering all of your questions. Nice. So that'll be one end. I'll make the other end and then the next one will be for the two short ends, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is just tie back tape these okay. so then I don't have to cove it funny, okay? okay. I'm wiping the dust so that that tape has a very good bond. Mm -hmm. Pre-applying the Tyvek tape to the sides that are vertical actually saves time in the long run. All right, so we're gonna get my pocket screws. Okay, they're a okay. special kind of screw. Show you the bit. Oh, yeah. See how long it is and it's a square drive? Yep. So it'll reach into that hole. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is actually take these and there's a little bit of a, it's called a step bit because it's a big hole to a little hole. You find that little hole and you just push that in there a little bit to secure okay. it. And I'm just gonna go right down the line here, okay? okay. So I'm just gonna get it flush. I'm ensuring a very true edge while following the factory side okay. of the sheet good. So see this high point from snapping it off? We're just gonna remove that real quick. I have some evidence, a little nub left over from snapping the river table in half using my fulcrum. The 50 grit metal sanding disc makes short work of that removal. So now what I'm gonna do is take my river table and mock it up. Because I have a true side that I've already screwed into place, I get to measure off that and keep the rectangle perfect. All right, check this out. Guys, uh, what I've done here is I've gotten a backstop. This yes. backstop is is true. Yep. It's, it doesn't go in and out. It's I've used the factory edge. I know it's true. So I'm measuring off of that to this point. That's yep. 36 inches. That's 36 inches. And I don't care what the river is. This is this is supposed to be abnormal, right? Yeah. So so that's how I get a square piece out of a tree, okay, or a true rectangle. All nice. right. So now I'm just going to do this and trace my edge because this is where my next board needs to be. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. So now, now I'm going to do that. Um, but the first thing that I'm going to do is cut two pieces at 36 inches exactly. That makes 
my board's perfect, okay? Awesome. All right, so let's do that. Let's do it. So I want those edges 36 inches. Boom, I go 36. I'm gonna put my stop block right here at 36. And I just clamp that. And now I get two pieces exactly the same, okay? I love the tried and true method of stop blocks because it creates perfect repeatable cuts every time. What's the next step on these? Boom. Time to add some pocket holes in our verticals for the side pieces of our form. And then we get to butt the final long piece of our form to these 36 inch true cuts and keep everything perpendicular and parallel so that we create a professional finish. So using a speed square can keep your form square, at least on one end. So you only have one end that's slightly pinched and you have less to cut off when you're done with the project. So keep the end that has the most wood square and you only trim one end when you're done. That's a pro tip. Actually, these are cut pretty non-square. I'm gonna go cut these on that chop saw. Use whatever method of cutting that creates the safest, most predictable cut. In this case, I'm flipping the river table piece over itself so I could finish the cut. It's a pretty big piece, but the chop saw plunges all the way through. Okay, let's do this one. Boom. Now we're tight. So what, what I'm gonna do is, here's my short point. Yep. That's where I need to cut both of them. Okay. When originally cutting my slab to size, I left some meat on the bone, remember? So this is a perfect example of why that's important. I get to true it up as I go, so I get some allowance for imperfections. Okay, all I'm gonna do now is just screw these corners in so that it has strength like a box. Okay, we got uh, a surface planing router bit. Okay? Yeah. This is an old one and this is what we'll actually flatten these slabs with. Okay. Problem is these bits are expensive. I have a brand new one right here. Okay, these are about 50 bucks. So now I can't get that nail out. It's, it's just, I'm trying to drill it out. I'm trying to grab it. It's just not gonna happen. And I have to decide, am, am I gonna keep digging into the top of the surface? Uh, am I gonna sacrifice the look of the wood or am I gonna sacrifice an old bit? Okay, what would you do? Old bit? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an unlock is once I chip this up on that nail, I could kind of put this aside and in the future, I got a sacrificial bit for metal, yep. right? Guys, that's what I'm gonna do. What would you do? How would you get that nail out? It wins, I give up, it's staying <laughs> in the table. So uh, let's go ahead and continue on and we'll sacrifice the surface planing bit and then we'll use the new one when we, uh, when we get to the resin. Okay. Awesome. I showed you the slab jig, you haven't seen it in action yet. No, I you, haven't. You ready for this? I'm excited. All right, so I'll show you how that works. We'll flatten the bottom a little bit, but however much I take off of this one, I'll probably take off that one as well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at which one's the worst, and I think it's this side. Yeah. So I'm gonna take a little bit off of that. Okay. And then, uh, and then we'll do the same to this. Sounds good. Hey folks, Mitch here with Stone Coat Countertops. Question of the day, how are you enjoying this long form woodworking tutorial? Are you guys able to follow along with Mike and Jeff? We've broken it down into 12 easy steps for your next woodworking project. Let us know in the comments below. Option A, I'm getting tons of value. Or option B, I need more info. And if you chose option B, click that link in the description below. That's gonna take you to our website where we have 12 easy steps to river table success, our downloadable printable PDF. So when I'm using the slab jig, yeah. I wanna shim this thing so that I get I take off the least amount of material and I get it as flat as possible. Okay. If I had like a real low point here and I got, I went everything to that, I could be taking off a lot more than I need to. But yeah. because I shim this side up, I'm kind of splitting the difference between that corner and that, and that corner. corner. Okay. So right here, I'm three quarters of an inch to the bottom of that rail. Okay. Yeah. Over here, I'm about the same. In the middle where it's crowned, I'm a half an inch. Okay, so I'll have to take about a quarter, quarter inch, an inch off, off. off the middle. Yeah. So let's go down here. This I'm an inch, about seven eighths, and that I'm about three quarters. 
Okay. Okay. Over here, I'm an inch and a quarter. Ooh. Three quarters, three quarters. So this is my low point. <clears throat> Okay. okay. We're probably not going to go all the way down to that low point because I'll be taking off like a half inch on the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, whole thing. So I'll probably just take about a quarter on the whole thing, leave a little bit of a gap there because this will be tight. That'll be tight and we're just going to be filling that river up anyhow. Okay. It'll still look good. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, now there's literally no rock in it. So I'm just going to put some screws in to block this thing from moving. Backstops, okay? Mm. So when you make a table for doing uh, wood slabs, just keep that in mind that you wanna make it out of wood so you can do this kind of thing. I toenail temporary screws into my table as opposed to going through the slab just to hold it in place while I surface plane it. I'm using my slab jig, which works perfect on any jumbo slab to make it true. It avoids the need of a CNC machine and saves me thousands. Oh, awesome. So it took out a lot of that high point. I still got a pretty good thickness, but I think I'm just gonna go ahead and pour it like this. Okay. And I'll fill the rest of this in with epoxy. I'm gonna do the same thing on the next one. Okay. You're gonna help me. Awesome. Let's take this. Take it over there. So there's still a little wobble in it, and it's still got, you know, a high point here. Mm -hmm. But that's all going to fill in with the uh, resin. But underneath that, it flattened it out a lot. So we're not going to have it go back nearly as far, far. and nearly as deep. Okay. Yep. Woodworkers love our slab jig. This is the DIY Weekend Warriors wonder tool that gets the job done right. Check out StoneCoatCountertops.com to learn more about our slab jig. Jumbo size wood planers and CNC machines are not necessary to play in the woodworking revolution of river tables. You got this. How's that feel, man? Awesome. See how it shows you the high and low points immediately? Yeah. Good job, you did a really good job on that. Overcome the challenge of finding the perfect piece of wood for your project. We've partnered with the world famous Burl Hunter and now stock exotic slabs of wood right there on our website. Check it out. I guess, have you ever used a router before? Nope. That's your first time? You, like First time. You've never used a router and you did fantastic. Okay, let's dry fit this again. We'll take it out, tie back tape it, and okay. move on. All right. Guys, have you seen our Supercast? It's designed for these exact projects. It's designed to be poured thick. You wouldn't want to use our countertop epoxy for this reason, because you're only supposed to pour that an eighth of an inch at a time. That would take a long time to fill this up. You'd have to do a lot of pours. Supercast is formulated to be poured at least an inch thick at a time. It's a lot better than an eighth at a time. We're gonna get this done faster, more efficiently, and it's gonna come out fantastic. Let's go. I'll remove excess dust from our form. I'll line it with Tyvek tape to create a surface that the epoxy will peel from after I've poured the actual project. And then I just come here yep. and I poke the center. And then it'll tear it off, okay? Okay. And then I overlap by about a quarter inch at least. You basically make it a swimming pool for epoxy. You really want to iron any of this down because uh, the epoxy will find its way under it if it's not tight, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Stone Coat Epoxy has a tenacious bond to just about anything. Tyvek tape and its glossy surface allows it to be released from the form after we've poured. It's a pro tip. There's other options to be used as release agents such as silicone sprays and synthetic waxes. I tend to like the Tyvek tape because it reduces the variables. It doesn't introduce anything into the mix that might cause a reaction with the epoxy. All right, let's get some quick coat and seal these edges. To prevent air from the wood slab leaking into my finished pour, I'll seal the edges. Okay guys, here's what's next. I'm actually gonna sand these edges. The reason I'm gonna sand those is so I remove any of the marks that that 50 grit metal sanding disc left when I remove the bark. That way when we wet this out with epoxy, it looks exactly perfect. Is that even the right term, exactly perfect? 100%. I guess it, it just, it'll look good, okay? It'll, it'll look 
exactly pretty good. I'm using a heavy grit on my random orbital sander to remove any evidence of that 50 grit metal sanding that, disc. That'll work just fine, okay? So that's all I'm looking at right now. You'll do the other edge, I'll finish this one, all right? Awesome. All right, let's take this over. Let's lay it down here for a sec. Ready? Yep. Okay. All right, the step that we're on right now is to seal the edges and glue this down. We're gonna use our product called Quick Coat. It dries and sandable within about three hours at the temperature we're at, which is 70 degrees. It felt like 71, but it's 70. So we're gonna seal those edges. We'll get it locked down. It's gonna clamp it in place. We'll pour that river and this thing's really gonna start taking shape. Awesome, can't okay. wait. When we do the quick coat, we're gonna mix it with the drill um, for about two minutes, but get it out of the bucket. You don't want it generating that heat in the bucket. Okay. And, and you gotta move quick with it. You got about 15 minutes of working time Whoa. before it starts to set up. It's much different than our countertop product. I love having access to different products with different set times. Our quick coat allows us to stay on schedule. This is still day one in this project and we're about to lock it into the form and pour the actual river. It allows me to stay on time and get it done fast. All right, let's pull this out into the form. Okay. The reason I don't leave it right at the edge is because I want it dripping into the main part where it's gonna okay. glue it down, you know? So. I'm gonna pour it and you're gonna come back with your, by with your hand and okay. immediately spread it, okay? Perfect. All right, you ready for this side? Yeah. You did so good. I'm so proud of you right now. <laughs> Here we go. All right, so now what I'm gonna do with this excess is just I'm gonna put down my clamps, okay? Okay. A liquid clamp. The excess quick coat poured into the form will hold the slabs down during the pour acting as a clamp. All right, let's take it on down. All right. I'm just gonna take the excess now and just pour it right here on this edge again so it runs down that edge and almost glues itself down, okay? Okay. And what this is doing again is just sealing those so these edges won't leak air into the, uh, into the product. Plus it looks cool. Doesn't it wake that wood up? Yeah, it does. All I'm doing is torching out the bubbles. I don't care about perfection. This is just a seal coat. All of this is gonna get hidden with my finished coats. The two main jobs is to seal those edges so they don't leak air into the river and also to hold these pieces down. After this sets up in a couple hours, I'm gonna pour that whole river. Let's go. Supercast is something that you haven't used yet. Okay? No. This is designed to be poured nice and deep, okay? This is about um, two and a half inches deep. Now, what am I doing here? I got, I got black metallic powder, okay? I'm actually gonna tint this all black because our counters have some black in them, right? Yeah. I almost want it to look like frosted black glass. Okay, but not opaque, not where you can't see my LED lights. Remember those, <laughs> remember those lights we bought? So cool. You remember how much those cost? 20 bucks. 20 bucks for LED lights. You remember how much those used to cost, man? <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna light this up, but it's gonna be like uh, business during the day, party at night. What I'm about to tell you is a big unlock and a big pro tip. This awesome. is very important. How do I know how much metallic <laughs> to put in the epoxy to keep it as translucent as I want. I'm gonna teach you. I take that cup, okay. put a little straight edge across it, okay. and I put a mark, okay, right here on this cup. Now I know exactly how deep that river is, okay? So I'm gonna mix enough metallic in this whole bucket, and I'm gonna dip this in there and get it up to that. And then I'm gonna look through it. If I can see through it, I got, I got the right amount. If it's too clear, add a little bit more metallic. Okay. If it's too thick, too opaque, I'm only mixing one bucket at a time. I could then put clear in here and then box them together and nice. spread that out to amount. So this is a two to one ratio. Okay. okay. So a lot of our uh, mixtures are a one to one ratio. Yes. This is a different mixture. Just like our floor epoxy is a two to one. So that means two parts A, to one part B. We don't use a drill on this. We use a mixing stick. 
and you're gonna notice the viscosity is very thin on our super cast. If you mix with a drill and you're gonna pour it really deep, how do you get the air out? Because it's deep, it's in there. And mm. so we get very crystal clear results by mixing this with a stick and pouring it and torching it about every half inch or quarter inch and let it set up that way. So another thing you gotta keep in mind, we mix a lot longer, okay? We're gonna mix, because this does not set up fast mm -hmm. and we're not mixing with the drill and we wanna make sure we get a thorough mix. So we're gonna mix for like five to eight minutes. I'm gonna go get a little bit of a metallic, I mean a little spoon or something so I could put metallic in there. All right. So okay. I'm gonna take a little bit of black metallic. Yep. I'm gonna get one side right, okay? Yep. So I'm just using a little tongue depressor. Yep. And you need to see how little I actually add. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna get a little bit more. That's how concentrated that is. Okay, ready? Let's mix that in. Our metallic powders are extremely high quality. A little goes a long way. Wow. See oh, what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my bucket. Fill it up. So it's, it's still pretty clear. Yeah. Not happy. Okay. So I'm gonna do more. Okay. So I'm gonna add about as much as I did. Okay. And I'm gonna do the same to yours. Okay. Because now I know I'm safe. Adding at out. least one. Okay. okay. Now I'll see what happens with two. Okay. Light still is coming through that. Let me actually right. go get a flashlight. See how you can't really see the flashlight? No. Ah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's why it's important to get your mark on there. <clears throat> and that's how you can really judge how it'll look. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now also under here, yep. under the bottom of the slab, I'll sand that rough. Okay. That way it hides in and distorts and diffuses the light. So I don't see a, a like a snake of LEDs under there. It blocks that. Make sense? Yeah. Despite using a small amount of our metallic powder, you still get that high contrast shimmer that looks very natural, but takes our project up about 10 notches. Oh yeah. Wow. That is really gonna pop, man. As I'm pouring my layers, I'll torch out the bubbles and then I'll continue to pour. Yeah, here we go again, second round. See how you torch it between yeah. coats and see how perfectly crystal clear it is? Wow. Okay. It's gorgeous. Those metallic, that metallic color popping out of there. I told you, man. Oh. Isn't that cool? I've been a do-it-yourselfer, a contractor, and a remodeling artist in my entire life. Understanding what's available to me in the different trades, such as plumbing and electrical, drywall and painting, knowing the tips, tricks, and tools that I can use has been an absolute game changer. Epoxy is no different, and it's changed the way that I think about remodeling. All right, we're gonna let this set up. We'll come back tomorrow. We'll do another pour to top this thing off and then we'll be ready for the next step. We get to plane this all down flat, do our seal coats, do our final flood coat, put this on the countertop, and watch the reaction of none other than my own mother. Can you believe what we accomplished in the first day on this project? Oh my goodness, you got your light in here? Okay, it's the next day. Yeah. How cool is that looking? Oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. You hear that fan, guys? This fan is blowing air across this table, okay? The reason it's doing that is to dissipate heat. Any heat generated by this mass or this volume of epoxy, this will push it away from the surface to actually keep this cooler. If it gets too hot, it can crack that epoxy. The amount that we did yesterday and the depth that we did yesterday is absolutely nowhere near that breaking point. Let me explain. It's been about mm, close to 24 hours, okay? If I touch this, you'll see it's still gooey, 
okay? It still has some movement, but it's starting to gel and solidify. Remember, our supercast is designed to be poured thick, so it's a very slow cure, so it doesn't overheat when it's in a mass. So what we're gonna do right now is mix another batch. We'll pour that, and as the bottom layer is curing, the top layer will also cure. Let's get started, let's finish this pour. That way I can come back, plane the top, and finish this table. You ready? I'm ready. In the woodworking section of our website, we have a volume calculator that will help you determine exactly how much epoxy you need for your project. I know that my first day on any river table project is usually my most labor intensive. Typically, it's about a 15 hour project and process from start to finish on my river tables. Next step is gonna be simple, just fill the river. All right, so yesterday we sealed the edges, right? Yes. So if we didn't do that, chances are you would have a little line of bubbles right where the epoxy meets the wood. And that's because the air is coming out of that edge, yeah. traveling up that seam and uh. kind of solidifying and trying to pop. And as it starts to gel, it's not gonna, it's not gonna pop, okay? So that's why we seal the edges. Okay. Now let's say you, you did get it, uh, one of those, even if you sealed the edges, no big deal. We broke it up into two pours, okay? So you could actually sand those out a little bit and pour again, you'll never know that you had a bubble. Let's say it was all the way up to the top and that happened. You could always sand the tops of those bubbles off. When you, when you sand this whole thing down and you pour your clear, it's gonna hide them for you too. Nice. Okay, so it's forgiving. We set the system up so that you don't make those errors. Even if you make those errors, they're definitely fixable. I'd say epoxy is one of the most forgiving mediums in construction I've ever used. All right, so we're gonna box these together. To yeah. ensure consistency in the intensity of the metallics, we're gonna mix the buckets together. Obviously, the more that you do that, the more uniform it'll become. Jeff turned out to be an amazing learner. He picked up on all of these simple tips and tricks and helped me create one of the best river tables I've ever built. Success isn't necessarily found in the size of your project, but following the steps. Why not start on a coffee table size project and work your way up into the river world wonderland of giant river tables. Experimenting with different wood species and colors that you're entraining into the center of the project really makes a difference. Okay guys, we got it filled to the brim. How, how'd you like pouring that? Oh, it was so, it's like butter. Right? I like that you just used what was in the bucket because when we go to plane this down, our low point is no longer the river. So we will get a maximized thickness on our total table, right? We mixed a little more epoxy than we needed, but again, we are an epoxy company. Yeah. So guys, be conservative <laughs> on what you pour, and if you get your table level, you won't waste a drop. Guys, what we're gonna do is let this set up, we'll come back, we'll plane it flat, we'll do our seal coats, we'll do our flood coat, we'll attach this to the countertops on site, and we are gonna let mom and dad see their new peninsula. Let us know, is this a piece of functional art that you would like to eat your breakfast cereal at? Let us know in the comments below. All right, time for the fun part. Now that the epoxy river is dried, it's time to take the project out of the form. I'm doing that by just simply reversing the steps. I'm removing the screws and popping the sides off of the table. They're coming off easy again because I sealed all of that melamine with Tyvek tape. It's a great release. It's really easy to take off your form. Just start with the screws, score the tape, pop those sides off. Heck yeah! Woo! I'm gonna take a three quarter inch straight flute router bit, okay? And I'm gonna actually come down here and router in insets for steel bars. Those bars are gonna prevent the wood over time from trying to warp or cup back to how it grew like a tree that makes it stable and last for years to come and be a functional art piece that you'll be proud of. So let's go ahead and reinforce this by cutting steel bars to size, embedding them underneath this, this project, and then we're gonna use our quick coat to seal those in so that they lock into place. And we'll move on to the next step, let's go. I'm creating a rough surface of mechanical bond and removing contaminants with my sanding disc. I took my 50 grit metal sanding disc and I went ahead and scuffed this up 
so the epoxy would bite to that steel like a dream. I also plugged these ends. I used to tape those, and that's okay, but what a clean look. I just cut a piece of wood really tight to fit into this square tube, and then I tapped it in and cut it off somewhat flush. I just left the wood a little bit proud of the steel so I didn't mess up my chop saw blade. That's a quick plug, man. <laughs> Never stop learning. The pro tip of the masterclass is if you're a woodworker, work with wood. If you're a painter, paint. If you're a sculptor, be sure to sculpt. Get your hands dirty, roll up your sleeves, and get ready to learn. I'm gonna use a straight edge so that my router can follow that while I cut this channel in. I also have a spacer, which is the same distance from the edge of my router to my bit. That way I use that spacer right here on these pieces of square tube. And it's giving me my exact location of where I'm gonna router this in. This spacer then shoves in so that I get a little bit wider channel than I want so that the epoxy can envelop this steel and give me a permanent bond. I'll show you right now how this works. It's fast, it's easy, and it's important to do so you don't get any cupping in your project. As opposed to some of my past projects, I didn't continue the steel support bars all the way through the epoxy river. I stopped short at the edge of the river because I only need stabilization in the wood section. The epoxy has plenty of natural strength. It didn't need the support square tubing. I router just a little deeper than the three quarter inch square tubing and a little bit wider. That way the epoxy will surround the square tubing and envelop it to hide it and give it massive strength for years to come. Using Quick Coat allows me to embed these steel bars and move on with the next step the same day. I mixed our Quick Coat at a one to one ratio. I'm mixing it with the drill, which is actually entraining a little bit of air. It'll turn the Quick Coat white. If you want to entrain less air, just mix it with a stir stick as opposed to a mixing paddle. But because this is the underside of my project and nobody's gonna see it, I really don't care how it looks. All right, all I'm doing is I'm using a squeegee and the quick coat to actually fill in all of these grooves and I'm just getting it flush. I'm gonna actually use the excess quick coat that I have mixed up to fill in any voids on the bottom because I wanna go ahead and seal the entire bottom of this slab. So the quick coat will set up nice and fast for me and allow me to sand this in a couple of hours and start the next step. After my quick coat has enveloped those steel bars and cured, I'm able to sand. I'm sanding it flush so that as I lay this down on my plywood to finish off the kitchen, it's gonna lay nice and flat. I'm just removing any of the high points. I'm switching out my used surface planing router bit to a brand new one because I'm gonna true the top of my river table. Now remember, I never did this, I just did the bottom of the river table so that I could pour it nice and flat. Now that the river table is poured, it's time to true the top. I'm gonna do that using our slab jig and it makes short work of this process. I'm just removing a little at a time as to not overwork the router or chip out the surface of my slab. After I finish truing the top of the slab with the slab jig and the router bit, it's time to remove any evidence of that router bit and the swirl marks left behind. I do this with my random orbital sander and different grits of sandpaper. I start at 60 grit and I work through all the way up to 220 grit. No need to go any higher than 220 because the epoxy will finish everything like a sheet of glass. I spend the majority of my sanding time on the initial 60 grit, removing any of those swirl marks. After that, it's just cross hatching. You're gonna go perpendicular and parallel to any of the wood grain to remove all of those scratches and prepare for the epoxy seal coats. Now that my river table surface is sanded, it's time to true up the edges. Remember, I left enough width and depth and height on my slab so that I could remove some stock to true it up at this time. I'm gonna use a skill saw and a straight edge to make sure I make a nice perpendicular cut so I get a very professional looking table. Remember the beginning of the masterclass. There was a big pro tip and that's do multiple passes per cut. In this case, I scored the edge and now I'm plunge cutting through the entirety of that edge so I get a beautiful cut. 
I used micro pin nails to attach my actual straight edge. This allowed me to ride that straight edge on my initial cut so I didn't wander. The second cut followed that initial cut and came out fantastic. The micro pins temporarily hold everything into place without any evidence. They're tiny, they're micro. I'll repeat the cutting process in the same form and fashion on both sides of my table. Now for the end grain. I'm gonna use my T-square because I have parallel edges to ensure that my T-square is true. Stone Cold kind of tops, you got this. Great comment. Hey, we got a great comment from Brian Fitz on our video where we saved the owner of a dentist office thousands of dollars using Stone Cold Platinum and our ultimate top coat. Brian writes, in addition to the platinum product with the new top coat, can a top coat be used over standard countertop epoxy and achieve the same durable finish? I'm redoing a heavy use conference room table and really need the durability, but I'm not sure my skills are ready for the shorter working time. Well, Brian, your answer is yes, absolutely. Our ultimate top coat is compatible with all other Stone Coat epoxies. All you need to do is simply sand with 220 wipe the dust and you'll be ready to go. Mike actually ends up cutting a piece off the table so it can fit on site. So we use the opportunity to try out the top coat so you guys can see the sheen difference. It gives that natural finished look, added durability, and this top coat was applied over our regular stone coat countertop epoxy. As far as the shorter working time, there's no need to be concerned. Just simply split your pores up. Do them a section at a time with what you're comfortable with and it will all meld together beautifully. You got this, Brian. Thanks for the great comment. That was a great comment and I appreciate you Luke for addressing that. I will be using that ultimate top coat on some of my woodworking projects in the future. I absolutely love what it did and created a natural low sheen finish. After I trim the edges of the project to true them up with my skill saw, it's time to use my random orbital sander to remove any skill saw marks. Then I'm ready to round over the edge with my 1 8 inch router bit that has a bearing that actually follows the edge so I get a beautiful finished top that allows the epoxy to roll over that edge. A 1 8 inch router bit actually gives a subtle round over that looks very sleek and modern. I love that 1 8 round over. I'm gonna use it on the bottom of the surface as well so that the drips will carry on underneath my table and I won't get any epoxy buildup at the bottom lip. There's another pro tip. After I've sanded the sides and I've routered in my edge, I'm gonna finish the entire project with 220 grit. One of the final steps through the process is to hand do the edges. I don't like to sand the edges with my random orbital sander because it tends to over sand, so I just do those by hand. I'm gonna wipe any of the dust. I finish it off with a wipe of acetone and I'm ready for my first seal coat. I'm using our original stone coat countertop epoxy, which is heat resistant, scratch resistant. It has zero VOCs and a long open time. I only need one ounce per square foot for my seal coats. This allows me to wet out the surface, but not overdo it and trap air in that surface, just like those edges. So I'm simply gonna use a shower squeegee and I'm gonna push the epoxy into the wood grain. I'll take my time because I have all the working time that I need to wet the surface out and use that one ounce per square foot and scrape it across the surface. Remember, it doesn't need to look perfect at this point. You're simply applying your first seal coat. We filmed this live on our Stone Coat Countertops Insiders group on Facebook. When we do our first seal coat on this river table. We, we make all kinds of different length content and we are sure hoping you're enjoying this masterclass. Be sure to check us out on the Insiders Facebook group so that you can learn how to apply epoxy like a pro. Now you know. Using a glove hand, I use any excess epoxy that dripped over the edges to apply my seal coat to the edges. I'm sweeping the surface with a torch just to get any excess bubbles. It's okay if it's not perfect at this point. The second seal coat starts to get it more and more close to that finished project. I'm gonna do the same process. I'm gonna sand with 220 grit. I'm gonna mix up our epoxy at a one to one ratio after I've sanded. Be sure to clean the surface, wipe it down with acetone to remove any excess dust 
and you're just going to repeat the process. In this case, I only needed three seal coats. That's a total of three ounces per square foot. It's not a lot of material, but I break the steps up so that I don't trap air bubbles in that epoxy. The consistency of stone coat epoxy is perfect for your river table flood coats and seal coats. It won't all run off the surface, but it absolutely will lay out like glass. But prepare that surface by making it non-porous and removing any opportunity for air to get into that final flood coat. That's why these seal coats are super important. All right, Masterclass, here's the tips and tricks that you won't learn anywhere but Stone Coat Countertops. How do you remove those final stubborn pinholes in any of the cracks, crevices, and knots that are commonly found in wood slabs? Here we're using our burn-in sticks. I get these off of Amazon. They're made by Mohawk, and it's almost like a wax stick. Check it out. All right, this is about ready for that flood coat. What I want to do right now is color this wood. It's a little too yellow for me right here. The sap wood in the redwood sometimes is almost a neon yellow, and you don't know until you open that slab up. So what I'm gonna do is cheat a little bit. I'm gonna actually tint this a little brown. I'm gonna spray that, I'll let it dry, and then I'll do my flood coat, but I want this thing to look more earth tone as opposed to yellow. Let's go. I'm going to use some toner in conversion varnish to actually tint the color of my slab. It's important to do it at this point because everything is sealed. You're going to get uniformity. I have an actual seal coat on this project. I'm masking off the river so that I don't tint that color and I'm just using a little bit of toner in my lacquer or conversion varnish to apply to a sanded surface. It's going to bond very well and it's going to dry fast. You could change the tone of wood using this process. I like the brown, that's looking good. But now it just looks a little bit too pink for me on the redwood. What do you guys think? Do you like the pink or would you darken it? I actually am going to darken it with a little bit more charcoal into this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just add a little bit of a charcoal hue to the whole project. You'll still see that it's redwood, but it'll kind of tone it down and it'll even make the brown a little more charcoal. Let's do it. Guys, I'm just using a normal HVLP sprayer to get this done. I'm a cabinet maker by trade as well, and I've been spraying cabinets for the better part of my professional career. If you're interested in this process, let me know in the comments if you want me to make separate content on how to tone, tint, and change the color and appearance of your wood slabs. I was pleased in the way I was able to preserve the characteristics of this redwood, but get the tone that I prefer. <laughs> That's cool. It already looks like it's glowing, dude. It's time for the final flood coat, so my brother and I move it into our final pour area. I loved how the light started to come through, and I'm just sanding and abrading that toner coat so that I can get a good mechanical bond with the epoxy and that color. Remember, that color coat is an optional coat. I loved what it did, and now it's time to add three ounces per square foot to the surface. This is the perfect amount for a flood coat because it allows the stone coat epoxy to lay out and flood and level like a sheet of glass. I begin the final flood coat by pouring out the bucket into the center of the project. Oh, that's gonna be sick. The epoxy is almost magical at how it will hide the abrasion of the scratches underneath to create that bond. I'm using a 1 8 by 1 8 square notch trowel to spread the flood coat. Next step will be to chop the surface using a chop brush. After I've troweled it out, the chop brush will do two things. It will ensure that I have a very good mixed material on the surface and it will also help to ensure that I hide any of the lines that may be caused by that trowel. So I'm simply going to prime that brush with the epoxy and I'll chop the surface randomly. I'm not gonna go in perfect rows. I'm just gonna be sure that I address every bit of the surface. If there's any tension in the epoxy, the chop brush will break that tension and allow epoxy to flood out. After that, I'm gonna do the edges with the chop brush. I'm simply gonna brush long horizontal strokes to get a flawless finish. Time to pop the bubbles by sweeping the torch across the surface and I test drive it with the LED lights. I have a little hair left in the surface and I'm using a tongue depressor split in half as chopsticks to remove that hair. Check out that light. I love this table.
After my flood coat dries, Mitch and I flip it upside down on a fresh sheet of plywood so it doesn't hurt the surface or scratch it. I'm going to use my 50 grit metal sanding disc to remove those bumps and the drips. I waited till now because I wasn't on site. I didn't worry about making dust. If I was on site, I could simply use a paint stick to remove the drips after I pour. I'm sanding those off, I'm blowing the dust, and I'm getting closer to the final steps. Hey, what's up? I'm Luke. Just a quick reminder, we have all the written instructions on our website. They'll teach you step by step how to kill your next river table project. We'll see you there. You got this. This river table is going to cap some cabinets in a kitchen. Therefore, I don't need metal legs or wooden legs as a base. I'm using plywood for the top of the cabinetry to hold my lighting so that I can just simply slide my river table on top. I'm making a jig so that I can router out a space to actually reflect that lighting. I know that my lighting is about a half inch tall, so I created a half inch cavity to bury that light in and then actually line it with HVAC tape. I needed something reflective. So after I routered a channel, I went ahead and grabbed some HVAC tape. You can find that at any hardware store and I created an instant reflective liner. There's a first time for everything and this was the first time I've ever done this actual process. I loved how it came out and looking back, I think I would do it very similarly. I was very pleased with the final result because this cavity was larger than the actual cutout of the river section of my project. Therefore, I can manipulate and move that lighting to need and desire so that I got the maximum light without seeing any of the hard dots or the contrast of those bright LEDs. Next step, I was gonna finish the edge of that plywood so I didn't have any voids that were visible on that cabinetry. This was a finished process and project, so I went ahead and used our all-purpose Bondo putty. I applied it by hand, I sanded it smooth, and I went ahead and painted it black. I just used my sandpaper to sand it and a weenie roller to roll it. I painted it black because that would kind of blend and hide with the project, it looked professional. I built all the cabinetry from scratch, so I finished assembling and installing the cabinets, and then it was time to template. I went ahead and put our finished plywood on site, and I got my template material. Our template material is designed so that we could wrap walls, trim, and follow the contours of any kitchen. It's perfect template material for making countertops fit like a glove. Visit us at stonecoatcountertops.com to see all the products used in this video. After templating, it was time to transfer those measurements to my wood slab. I decided I didn't want such a large overhang because I wanted this kitchen to be more open so that you can walk through it freely and not have any obstructions. So I traced my template and I followed my cut. Templating ensures that you don't make mistakes in your cuts. My wife and I had a blast working late together on this passion project. I couldn't wait to show my mom and dad their new river table. I like having excess pieces left over from a project. It allows me to test durability, sheen level, sanding, polishing. It allows me to showcase these projects to future customers. I can now show them what a river table looks like finished in this form. I love having scraps to test with. I did make it a little bigger than I anticipated, but that's okay. I used it later in the day. <laughs> Following my template, I was able to follow exactly where that trim came into play so that I didn't need to notch the trim on site. My river table slid into place as if it grew there. As the LEDs shifted color in the surface, I was amazed at the different looks that it gave me. It was so much fun to see how it popped the grain depending on the light that came through. My good buddy Kenny from RK3 Designs was out to help me finalize this project. We installed this using 100% silicone. We taped a perimeter around the cabinets and we locked it in with a simple bead of 100% clear silicone. Oh my gosh, can you believe how this looks? Oh. You run straight through down the river table. There's whole LED lights. I've never made anything like this before in my life. 
first DIY project that is anywhere near this scale. If I got this, you got this. Hashtag first time DIYer. My mom and dad absolutely loved the look of their new space. My mom and dad's dream has always been to have a log home and some of my close friends and local craftsmen helped me bring this project from concept to complete. Look at these, oh my gosh. They're little, you got your light in here? Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Mike, thumbs up. This is perfect, thank you. My mom and dad are some of the most amazing people on this planet. They're giving, loving, and they're living angels. Thanks, mom and dad. Man, I loved how that project turned out for my mom's house and fit right in with all the other Stone Coat projects in there. Have you had the opportunity to check out that epoxy shower? We completely transformed that bathroom. We installed epoxy shower walls that you will not believe are created from foam. Check out that link. It's gonna take you over to our epoxy shower walls video. You do not wanna miss that. It's gonna teach you how to save thousands on your next shower remodel. And from all of us here at Stone Coat Countertops, we'll see you on the next video. And don't forget, you got this.